Hello, this is part C of the Proof Complexity Lectures in the Satisfiability Bootcamp at the Simons Institute. Um, this talk will discuss CDCL, Conflict Driven Clause Learning, as an algorithm for satisfiability, and especially from a point of view of logic and its connections to the resolution proof system. Um, we'll cover first DPLL proof search, then CDCL, conflict driven clause learning proof search. And the last part of the talk will cover proof logging, uh, where you log a complete proof resulting from a proof search run, either as a RUP proof or more efficiently as a, as a, as a DRAP proof. Um, this talk will probably overlap somewhat with Armin Beer's talk uh, the day before in the bootcamp. But most likely, I'll be doing this from a different point of view, and this is one of the core topics for the special program of the Simons Institute, so I think it's worth some repetition, especially from a different point of view. Also, I want to mention that there's a survey article by Jakob Nordstrom and myself that will appear shortly in the Handbook of Satisfiability, second edition, and a lot of the material from this talk is based more or less directly on what's in that survey. Um, as an overview, conflict-driven clause learning solvers have been extremely successful in solving very large instances of satisfiability, routinely solving instances with hundreds of thousands and even millions of variables, especially coming from industrial or real-world applications as compared to com combinatorially based things. So this is really quite remarkable because of the fact that we know that resolution proofs may need to be exponentially long and the length of a proof is more or less a lower bound on the length of number of steps taken by a CDCL algorithm. Um, because when CDCL solvers find an instance of satisfiability to be unsatisfiable, they mostly implicitly find a resolution refutation. And uh, otherwise, they find it to be satisfiable, and generally they then exhibit a satisfying assignment. And it turns out to be a natural thing to extend CDCL solvers to include a so-called RAT inferences that I'll discuss near the end of this talk. And these make CDCL solvers, in theory, as strong as extended resolution. And I stress the in theory part because um, in practice, we don't know how to take advantage of that full strength. And at the final bullet point, an uh, early paper by Beam, Kautz, and Saberwall outlined this connection between CDL solver, CDCL solvers and resolution, and it's still a very useful paper to read. So I recommend that in addition to our own survey. So as a very high-level overview, SAT solvers, modern-day SAT solvers, are built on four principal components, or at least many of them are built on these four principal components. They have DPLL proof search, which is a kind of depth first search for resolution rep refutations where you iteratively set variables to true false and backtrack as needed. They use unit, pro unit propagation, which corresponds to a proof system called trivial resolution to help set variables ahead of time and guide the DPLL search, but also underpins clause learning. And clause learning is a method for inferring new clauses that are consequences of gamma or can be assumed without any loss of generality to be true and then help prune the search space. And finally, an unexpected component is restarts, which interrupt a depth first search and start off totally new search um, with not necessarily forgetting learned clauses. Now, the fifth bullet point is many more optimizations are there. I should mention variable selection algorithms, clause forgetting algorithms, um, and many others as well. So, but I'm gonna only mention these four aspects of CDCL solvers, and then probably Armin Bira has covered many of these other aspects for, op for optimization already. So this is a repeat of the slide from part A of these lectures, just defining the system resolution. So if this is new to you, I'll let you pause the video and take a look at it but pretty much I assume you know what resolution is. Uh, we start with, we're, we're given as input a set of clauses, namely representing a CNF formula. The goal is to either find, 
but the goal for resolution is to refute the CNF formula by showing it cannot be satisfied, and it's done by using the resolution rule shown here from X or C and not X or D, we infer C or D, and we use this iteratively to, return, to derive the empty clause. Uh, and then this is a sound and complete system for refuting CNF formulas, for refuting sets of clauses. So as a quick example of a resolution refutation, here we have the initial clauses are in square boxes uh, or re rectangular boxes. So like X or Y is an initial clause, an axiom, and it's in a rectangular box here, right? And then the inferred clauses are in oval boxes. So for instance, not Z is inferred from the clauses Y or Z bar and Y bar or Z bar by resolution on Y. And then from that, X bar is inferred by resolving X bar or Z with Z, Z bar and so forth, deriving ultimately the empty clause. And this can be written either as a DAG as drawn here or as a sequence as written here on the side. This particular refutation shown here is not regular because there's a path, namely start at the empty clause, go up to X, go up to X or Y bar, up to, up to Z bar, up to one of the axioms above it. Along this particular path, we resolved here on the variable y to derive x. We resolved here on the variable z to draw, derive x or y. We resolved here again on the variable y to derive z bar. So this path had two places where we resolved on y, and thus it's not regular. From Part A of this talk, you recall that any unsatisfiable set of clauses has a regular resolution refutation, but this particular one is not. So on to the DPLL search procedure. DPLL stands for the authors of two papers. There was Davis, Putnam, Logeman, and Loveland. There was a paper, Davis and Putnam, from 1960, and a paper by Davis, Logeman, Loveland a couple of years later, and which outlined together essentially what's known as the DPLL algorithm. So the input to the DPLL algorithm is a set of clauses, gamma, and the goal is to either find a satisfying assignment row that makes every clause in gamma true, or to find a refutation of gamma, or at least to find evidence that gamma is unsatisfiable. So the DPLL algorithm works very straightforwardly. It performs a depth first search through the space of partial truth assignments. It sets literals one at a time, uh, and forming and maintains a partial truth assignment row. When needed, it backtracks to change the values, the settings of literals, and try again. And when does it backtrack? It backtracks when some clause is falsified by virtue of having all the literals in it set false. So the algorithm is as follows. We initialize row to be the empty assignment, and then we use the following recursive procedure. So the recursive procedure does the following. First, we'll check if the current partial assignment row falsifies some clause of gamma. If so, we return false. This is not saying that the formula is unsatisfiable. It's just saying that the partial assignment's not working to satisfy gamma. Uh, otherwise, if row satisfies gamma, then we're done. The row is set at least one literal true in each clause. It's a satisfying assignment and we can output row as a satisfying assignment and terminate. Otherwise, and here's the depth first search component of the algorithm, we pick some currently unset literal x, we call that the decision literal, we extend row by setting the literal x to be true, we call this recursive procedure recursively, and if it returns, it will return false, but if it returns at all, we update row now to set x to the opposite value false, and we try calling the procedure again recursively, now with row modified to set x false. If that also returns, of course it returns false, then we just return false. If the top level call to DPLL uh, returns false, then the original formula gamma, the original set of clauses gamma was unsatisfiable. And in this case, it terminates saying that the formula is unsatisfiable. Otherwise, it terminates with a satisfying assignment. 
Now, in the case when it terminates saying that gamma is unsatisfiable, it's implicitly found a tree-like regular proof. If you take the tree of recursive calls in the DPLL algorithm, that exactly mimics the form of a tree-like regular proof. The regularity is because we, once a literal has been set at row, we don't change its value unless we backtrack and unset its value to the opposite. And um, tree-like is because the depth-first search algorithm is implicitly tree-like. So here's an example of a tree-like refutation arriving from a DPLL proof search. Uh, this uses the same initial clauses as shown in the image on the previous slide, but uses a different refutation because we need to have a regular refutation to correspond to DPL proof search. The previous refutation was not right regular. So in this case, the, the depth first traversal is shown on this line down here. And it starts by setting x true, then z false, then backtracking, then z true, y false, and backtracking, and so forth. And let's see how this traverses the tree. It ends up being a leftmost depth first traversal of the proof tree. So we start at the root with the empty clause. When we set x true, we're implicitly walking to this clause here, which contains not x. So the invariant is that the current set variables are falsifying the clause in the refutation that we're traversing. So we've set x true, then we set z false, and this falsifies this gamma clause, this clause from gamma. So we, having set that clause false, we backtrack and set z true. And now we're at the clause z bar, and this is also set false by the current assignment, which sets z true. We, in this traversal, we then set y false, and we end up falsifying this input clause. So we backtrack by setting y true. We falsify this input clause. Now we backtrack all the way back to the, the root and set x false. So we're at this point in the traversal, and we're at this node in the, in the tree, in the proof tree. We continue like this until we backtrack completely out of the tree, having failed to find a satisfying assignment. Each attempt at the traversing the tree towards the leaves resulted in a falsified input clause from gamma. So you can check that this actually works as a one-to-one -one correspondence between DPL proof search and tree-like regular refutations. Uh, one thing to notice here is there's some efficiencies in the DPL proof search it's not literally trying all possible truth assignments, uh, so it has a chance of running much faster than exponential time in some cases, because you do not need to set all the variables on all the paths of depth first traversal. In fact, this happened already at the very first path. We set x true and z false, and then we did not set the value of y. We had already backtracked. So that way, there's truncation occurs once we set a clause false. So now we're going to add the second ingredient, which is unit propagation. So here we suppose that C is a, for, for unit propagation, let's describe this first, as a general principle. If C is a clause in gamma or in our currently set of derived clauses, and if rho, the current truth assignment, has set all but one of the literals in C false, then any satisfying assignment extending rho must set the remaining literal in C true. So we augment DPLL with unit propagation to take this into account. So the algorithm is the same as the DPLL algorithm, but whenever it's possible to do unit propagations with the current truth assignment, the current partial truth assignment row, we do them because those values are forced. There's no point in trying to set those values to the opposite value. And then We'll show the uh, algorithm on the next slide, but first, just to mention a connection to proof complexity, we define a unit refutation to be a resolution refutation in which each resolution inference has at least one of the two hypotheses of the inference is a unit clause, a clause with a single literal. And as a theorem, gamma has a unit refutation if and only if unit propagation finds a contradiction from gamma starting with row the empty assignment. So we get a connection between 
unit propagations and unit refutations. So continuing on to the definition of DPL with unit propagation, we again have a recursive procedure. We start by setting rho to be the empty partial assignment that sets values to none of the variables, and then we recursively call this procedure. Uh, the first step saves a copy of rho as rho zero. This is for backtracking purposes. Uh, we then extend rho by unit propagation for as long as possible. So in other words, we update the partial truth assignment rho by setting true any literal which follows by unit propagation. And setting one literal by unit propagation may trigger other ones becoming true by, by, by unit propagation. Once we're done with that, we check whether rho falsifies some clause of gamma. And if so, we return false and we're backtracking. Otherwise, if rho fully satisfies every clause in gamma by setting at least one literal true in each clause, we output rho as a satisfying assignment and the process terminates completely, no backtracking involved. Otherwise, now we're back to how DPLL works. We pick some literal x that has not been set yet. We call that the decision literal. We extend rho to set x true. Uh, we call this procedure recursively. Uh, we otherwise update rho to set x false, and we call the procedure recursively. If that fails, we're completely backtracking out here. We restore rho back to the saved value rho zero, and we return false going back one level in the DPL procedure. So we can also give a characterization of learning. Uh, so we, for this is going to this will be the logical foundations of clause learning. So we say that a resolution derivation of a clause D from gamma is trivial if the following things hold. So the first is that it's an input refutation. So in other words, every resolution inference in the refutation has at least one hypothesis from a clause in gamma. The clauses in gamma are called input clauses. So we're saying that we, as we derive things, we're always using at least one input from gamma as a hypothesis. And the second condition is that it's regular. Okay, so this is the definition of trivial res re resolution. It's not so clear why you would want to work with trivial re resolution, but the reason becomes much clearer when you get the, the following characterization of trivial resolutions. For this one, we let gamma be a set of clauses and let C be a clause uh, x1 or x2 or dot, 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 xn. So C has n literals in it. And we let rho be the partial truth assignment satisfying the xi's in C. And then the theorem is that the following are equivalent. A, there's a trivial derivation of C from gamma. And B, unit propagation starting with the partial assignment rho based on C, the partial assignment rho that falsified the literals in C, and the clauses in gamma yields the empty clause, falsify, in other words, falsifies some clause in gamma. So unit propagation this way can be done very quickly. Unit propagation is essentially a linear time algorithm and we're very close to that and uh, can be done very quickly. So that's an advantage of unit propagation. We have a special notation for this property. We say that gamma one implies C. With a, so it's a turnstile for derivation with a subscript one. And there's two terminologies that are used in the literature. The older one is C is inferred by reverse unit propagation from gamma. And the other one is that C is an asymmetric tautology. Okay. And the, again, to stress this property, to stress this condition, the property gamma one implies C, that C is a reverse unit propagation clause or an asymmetric tautology, can be checked in polynomial time, in fact, essentially in linear time. So when we introduce clause learning, we're going to use this as the basic tool for learning clauses. We'll only learn clauses that can be inferred in this way.
So now we can describe the CDCL algorithm. So this is the core of you know, many or most of the modern successful SAT solvers, of at least the general purpose successful SAT solvers. So we have the following new ideas on top of the DPLL with unit propagation. First of all, when we do unit propagation to uh, derive a conflict, um, we're, we, we discover clauses that can be learned or inferred by trivial resolution. These learned clauses are saved into gamma. They become one of the currently known clauses, and they can be used to help future proof, proof search. And in particular, they help prune the proof search, uh, in, in effect, reducing the need to, to retraverse the same area of the search space over and over again after backtracking. One important feature of this is that learned clauses help compensate for poor choices of decision literals. And other optimizations include things like backtracking or backjumping, which allows backtracking past decision literals that did not participate in the clause learning process, thus further avoiding the need to retraverse the same proof, uh, search space over and over again. So here's the algorithm for CDCL. A uh, very high level thing, uh, the basic version, there's many refinements, of course. So we have a new variable L, which is the decision level. So each time a variable is set as a decision variable, or more generally inferred by, by, by unit propagation, we remember the level at which it's searched. That's the level at which it's set. The first decision variable is set at level zero, the next one's set at level one, and so forth. We initialize by setting rho to be the empty partial assignment. And now we loop. So some of this looks like DPLL with unit propagation and some of it is adding learning. So we extend rho by unit propagation for as long as possible. If it satisfies gamma, <coughs> we return rho as a satisfying assignment. Otherwise, if it falsifies some clause, in, clause of gamma, before we would just backtrack, but now we do some learning. Um, if we're falsifying a clause at level zero, we just return unsatisfiable. We're just saying that without any assumptions about decision variables, we falsified some clause. So if we falsify things at level zero, it's unsatisfiable. Otherwise, we learn one or more clauses C and add them to gamma. These clauses are learned by reverse unit propagation or trivial resolution. Uh, and they get added to the database of clauses. We choose a back jumping level L prime less than the current level. We unassign all the literal set at levels greater than L prime, and we set L to L prime, and now we're gonna backtrack. If we don't else, if we haven't falsified any clause at the current point, we just traverse deeper. We pick some unset literal X, this is the decision literal, we extend rho to set x true, we increase the level L plus one, and we continue with the next iteration of the loop. So this is CDCL. So let's talk about the learning process. This was the new part of this was the learning process, optionally learning one or more clauses. Usually it's just one clause, and usually it's what's known as a UIP clause or first UIP clause unique implication point. So here's an example of a so-called conflict graph and first UIP learning. So here we've got a decision literal X written now with a square box. And here I've got the empty clause here on the right-hand side. And each place here, let's see what this graph means. We've got some gamma has the following clauses that are written here. The first one is not x or not a or z. And that means the same as x and a implies z. And corresponding in the conflict graph, I have an arrow from x to z and an arrow from a to z. And the meaning of this is because the incoming edges of z come from x and a, once x is set true and a is set true, z follows by unit propagation. The next one, for example, is not x or not z or y, and that says that y follows, it's in the graph, from x and z by unit propagation. And then this pattern continues throughout the whole graph. At the very end, uh, we have falsity follows from 
if T and V and W are set true, we get a contradiction. And here I've got the clause T bar or V bar or W bar, and that gives us the contradiction. X is the top level decision literal, the one that was last set as a decision literal. A, B, and C are drawn with dotted things to mean they were set at lower decision levels. And then Z, Y, T, U, V, S, W were all derived at the same decision level as X by iterative use of unit propagation. And now this dashed line here, sometimes called a cut, is separating the empty clause and some of the literals that were used to derive it by unit propagation from the rest of the literals. And so that if you'll notice here, we've got the edges crossing the dashed line. There's one from C to W, one from B to W, one from A to U, and then several from Y to S, T, U, and V. And so what this tells us is that if we set Y true, A true, B true, and C true, that's enough to get the empty clause by unit propagation or to get a contradiction via unit propagation. And so this tells us that it's not possible to have all four of those literals true. And thus we can learn the clause not A or not B or not C or not Y. They can't all be true. One of them must be false. At least one of them must be false. And so this is a possible learned clause and it can be learned as a reverse unit propagation clause, just following the pattern in the graph up there. And this is called a first UIP clause, because if you'll notice here, this is this particular dashed line, this particular cut, has the property that there's only one literal Y at the top decision level that is in the uh, learned clause, or its negation is in the learned clause. So we're looking for this sort of bottleneck point where there's only one clause at the top decision level, and from that everything else follows the, using, using literals from lower levels. And it's the first UIP because it's the bottleneck level that's closest to the empty clause. Other comment here is once we have learn the clause A bar or B bar or C bar or Y bar, this clause becomes asserting in the following sense. Asserting means if we backtrack by unsetting all the literals at the top level, and we can backtrack as much as we want as long as we don't unset any of A, B, or C, then Y bar can now be inferred by unit propagation from the fact that A, B, and C are set true in the current partial truth assignment. And so this Gen this gives y true by unit propagation without another decision variable. And this can then in turn trigger further unit propagation before settling down and needing another decision literal. So here's another example. Uh, this is with a different set of clauses, not the ones from the previous slide. So here we're doing a CDCL refutation of the clauses shown down here. Here's our initial set of clauses, gamma. And uh, the algorithm is going down the first column and then learning this clause in the dark oval, down the second column, but skipping the dashed boxes and learning this clause in the dark oval, and then down this column and learning the empty clause, as it were, thus getting a contradiction. So the way it works is it first sets w as a, to the value false as a decision variable. So this w is assigned zero or false as a decision variable. Now, once w is set false, we have the clause not u or w, and we use that to set u to false by unit propagation. Now, nothing else follows by unit propagation, so we take x to be set as a decision variable to zero. And then unit propagation gives y, and then a further unit propagation gives a z, and then we have falsified a clause, namely the clause y bar or z bar. So now if you choose the cut appropriately, namely x is the first UIP literal, 
we can learn by unit prop by reverse unit propagation the clause u or x. So this clause is added to the database of clauses. So now we backtrack to uh, unset the value of x. We don't need to backtrack all the way, though these things are shown in dashed. The dashes around the w set to zero and the u set to zero means we don't redo that work. We just save it. Now, because we just learned u or x, and that's an asserting clause, now x is set true by unit propagation because u is false and we've learned the clause u or x. Further unit propagation gives z and falsifies the clause x bar or z. So now x is again the first UIP as it turns out. So we learn the clause x bar. Now this was set at level zero so we can backtrack all the way, unsetting also w. And we have that x bar is set to zero by unit propagation from the unit clause x bar. And then further unit propagation gives u, w, and, and falsifies the clause u bar or w bar. And now uh, we get just directly by unit propagation, a derivation of the empty clause. So then to view this CDCL proof search process as a proof, we just throw away the stuff about how things were derived. And here is the corresponding resolution reputation. We have, using these three initial clauses on the left, we have a trivial derivation of u or x. Now, using the next two clauses here in the middle, in the, in the rectangles, we have a trivial derivation of x bar. Now, using these two learned clauses and two more of the original clauses, we get a trivial derivation of the empty clause. So what you're seeing here is we have a sequence of trivial resolution derivations that the results are saved as learned clauses from each resolution, each trivial res resolution reputation, and eventually we derive the empty clause. So that was the overall description of the CDCL algorithm and how it relates to re resolution proofs. Um, another important ingredient is a so-called restart. So a restart means backtracking the CDCL proof search back to level zero where no decision literals have been set. And, but this can be maintaining the learned clauses. Um, and it's perhaps surprising, but restarts are extremely effective in the practical use of CDCL solvers. I should add, I said maintaining the learned clauses, but in fact, another big strategy that's used is forgetting learned clauses uh, because that makes the proof search procedure faster. Um, and uh, it's a very nice theorem of Peapot, Sriswat, Darwish, and Atsari speak to thoroughly, uh, building on earlier work of Beam, Cal, Savarwal, Sav is that CDCL plus restarts can piece simulate res re resolution. Uh, there's a bit of a caveat to this theorem. So that, first of all, CDCL plus restarts must make the correct choices to simulate re re resolution. There's no no known guidance for the procedure to follow. Um, and um, the other is that you really need to do a lot of restarts for this to work well. So um, even now it's true that CDCL solvers work quite well with a lot of restarts, but it's not clear that it works so well because of this theorem. Um, but nonetheless, this means that CDCL plus restarts is as powerful as resolution. And conversely, it's not hard to show that back just more or less the outline of the previous slides shows that resolution can piece simulate CDCL even with restarts. So what this means here is if you're given the description of a CDCL algorithm and how it's done decision literals and unit propagation and learning and restarts, then res re resolution can be, a, then a resolution reputation can be extracted from that description of the run of the CDCL algorithm. An interesting question is what happens if we don't allow restarts? And this is actually open. So whether CDCL without restarts can simulate re re resolution. There's a couple mathematical models for this question. Uh, I should mention pool res resolution by Van Gelder 
and Reg WRTI by Hoffman, Johansson, and myself. These give models for how CDCL without restarts might work uh, as proof systems. And uh, a pool resolution refutation is a re resolution refutation that viewed as a DAG admits a depth first regular traversal. Um, the Reg WRTI has a more complicated definition I won't go into. And so it's open, for instance, whether either of these systems can simulate resolution. Um, again, there's a caveat here as well on the definitions of pool resolution and reg WRTI is that CDCL solvers without restarts can do things that are not permitted by pool resolution or reg WRTI. So the correspondence is not exact there either. So for the final part of the talk, I want to talk about the idea of extracting resolution proofs from CDCL solvers in a practical setting. So CDCL solvers are nowadays very, compl very complicated things with lots of optimization te 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 techniques. And um, they're not only hard to code and get the code correct without any bugs, it's also hard to combine different techniques that don't subtle, that don't interact in subtle ways that can lead to unsound re reasoning. So thus it's desirable to have SAT solvers output reputations that can be verified independently of the SAT solver code itself. So the first proposal along this lines was to, was to use a RUP proof, reverse unit propagation proof. So an, R, an RUP proof is a sequence of clauses, C1 through CK. And it's supposed to be, it's, I'm calling it a proof, but it's really a refutation of gamma. Uh, we start off with gamma zero is just the set gamma, and now we're going to add successively C1, then C2, then C3, et cetera, forming gamma one, then gamma two, then gamma three. And we want the property to be <clears throat> that C, the L plus first clause added, is a reverse unit propagation consequence of the previous clauses. So in other words, gamma sub L one implies C sub L plus one. And then we want to end up with the empty clause. Um, so we can also add the deletion inference to throw away clauses that aren't needed. And this, interestingly enough, can greatly improve the verification time already. So this is a nice idea, and it fits very well with the simplified version of the CDCL algorithm, CDCL algorithm I described earlier in the talk. But it doesn't correspond very well to actual CDC L algorithms with full optimizations. So to give just a couple examples of this, uh, CDCL solvers also frequently infer clauses that are not implied by gamma. A prime example is the, the pure literal inference, which is if a literal P appears only positively in gamma, so but the negation of P does not appear in any clause in gamma, then we can, without loss of generality, set P true. And this is known as a pure literal inference. But it doesn't mean that P follows from gamma in any logical sense. So in particular, the, the unit clause P is not a reverse unit propagation consequence of gamma. Uh, the extension rule is a very powerful rule, as we know. And it also uh, can be used in proofs. So in particular, for a new variable x, we can infer three new clauses expressing that x is equivalent to q or and r. And there they're shown here. And this can be done without loss of any soundness properties. Even though these three clauses don't follow as logical consequences of gamma, they can be inferred to say that they're true without loss of generality. And um, this particular viewpoint was articulated by Rabola Pardo Suda. And the key property here is that when we infer new clauses we, and add them to the database gamma of clauses, we don't want to change the condition of whether the set of clauses is satisfiable or unsatisfiable. So this is called equisatisfiability. We infer clauses that may not follow logically, but when added do not change the satisfiability or the unsatisfiability of the set of clauses. And there's a lot of ways to do this kind of inference with equisatisfiability. And one particular one is what's known as a, 
That is a, a RAT inference. So RAT stands for Resolution Asymmetric Tautology. And uh, so the definition of RAT clauses are the following. We've got a set of clauses gamma. We want to infer a new clause C, and C will be so-called RAT with respect to gamma. And C has the form C prime or P. So P is a literal appearing in C, and C prime is the rest of C. We say that C is RAT with respect to P and gamma if for every other clause, not P or D prime in gamma, so every other clause containing the negation of P, when we resolve C prime against this clause, we obtain a clause C prime or D prime, which is an asymmetric tautology in that this clause C1 or D prime is one implied by gamma, or it follows by trivial resolution. And the RAT inference allows adding to gamma any clause that can be inferred by a RAT inference. And this can be shown to preserve satisfiability and also to preserve unsatisfiability. Now, Clearly, it preserves unsatisfiability. If gamma is unsatisfiable, adding a new clause to it is still unsatisfiable. For satisfiability, we can prove this theorem by looking at the first step of the Davis-Putnam procedure. The Davis-Putnam procedure can pick any literal, let's let it be P, and resolve away all occurrences of P by doing all possible re re resolution inferences on P. So when we've added C prime or P, the newly obtained clauses by resolution on P are the form C prime or D, which are already logical consequences of gamma. So in this way, it's safe to add C, that is safe to add C prime or P, because if we run the Davis-Putnam procedure for one step, eliminating P, we don't get anything new. And this includes, for instance, things like the extension rule can be done this way. So the DRAT proof traces or DRAT proof logging system is we have a sequence of clauses which update the current set of clauses with two rules. There's RAT inferences which introduce C by a RAT inference. And this, by the way, includes resolution and hence trivial resolution and hence um, learned clauses. And you know, as, as described before. We also allow the deletion rule <coughs> to remove any clause C. So this system is sound in the sense of if we're trying to refute a set of clauses, we won't go wrong with this kind of, these kind of steps. Uh, an interesting fact is it often takes longer to verify refutations than to generate them. Uh, and the, that's the reason for the presence of deletion. By deleting clauses, it makes this unit propagation property easier to verify because there's fewer unit propagations to do if there's fewer clauses in the database. So this has been quite successfully used for to verify large refutations. A particularly noteworthy one in size was uh, reported widely in the popular press as well. Uh, Bill is the world's largest math proof, which I think is about true. This was a Pythagorean triples problem um, which uh, was carried out by Hoyle, Coleman, and Merrick on parallel processing. Um, it generated a DRAP proof size of 200 terabytes, which was compressed by all the way down to 14 terabytes, and then with further special encoding down to 68 gigabytes. I don't know the details of all that. The runtime for generating the DRAP proof was about two days, 3,700 plus C CPU hours. Uh, and the verification time was about 16,000 CPU hours. But the point here is that we actually, they were actually able to verify the proof in, independently of the run of the CCL algorithm. As I already mentioned, the DRAP proof system can simulate extended re re resolution, and the same is true in the other direction as well. Um, Namely, extended resolution can p-simulate the DRAT system. So to just give the proof idea for one direction, that the DRAT proof system p-simulates extended resolution, is that the three clauses of an extension rule for x, if and only if, q, and r, which are shown here, 
These can be introduced one at a time as rat clauses. So x is new, so if we introduce x or r or x bar, this is trivially rat because there are no clauses that contain x. We introduce q or x bar, that's again tri tri trivially rat. And then when we introduce q bar or r bar or x, this is also rat because the only way to resolve on x is against these two just introduced clauses, and they give tautologies with q or q, q, q bar or r or r bar contained in the clause. So thus, DRAT, since it simulates extended resolutions, a very powerful proof system, but it's open how to extend the CDL solvers to exploit this full strength of DRAT, namely how to extend them to exploit the full strength of extended resolution. That's the end of part C. Thank you very much.